there are few games out there that are as impactful as Earthbound. A wacky RPG set in modern times where you fight weird freaking enemies while stupid things happen. What's not to love? The charm and creativity surrounding everything made this initially obscure game into one of the most influential games ever. Being able to eat a burger in an RPG was one of the most defining features of its time. A lot of games out there are inspired by it, and they managed to capture the same charm and craziness while still being unique. A lot of RPG Maker games typically take inspiration from it because it's a simple engine to make games with. I should honestly play more of these. I loved Lisa the Painful and a lot of other RPG Maker games look right up my alley. If I were you, I wouldn't be surprised if I turned this into a marathon of reviews. Anyway, one game that seems to have some of that Earthbound magic thrown into it is Jimmy and the Pulsating Mass. I remember following it ever since I watched a review of the demo and it was finally released in 2018. But despite having it on my Steam wishlist, I ended up ignoring it more than a lot of my old running gags. I guess I never really make any plans. And whenever I finally did buy it, it ended up staying uninstalled in my Steam library for over a month. Though I finally got around to playing it a little bit ago, and I think it's definitely worth a review considering how little buzz I hear about it. So, let's take a look inside. Jimmy and the Pulsating Mass. Man, look at that title screen. It's a big, gross, throbbing thing. <laughs> The game opens up on Jimmy being awoken by his mother singing in a field. A big, imaginative field. I, I knew things were going to get weird, but I expected this to be a little more grounded in reality, but whatever. What's poppin', Jimbo? Jimmy walks inside his home, and his mother says something about needing honey to bake a cake or whatever, and then both parents head off for adult fun time. I'm an expert in that stuff, and even I don't want to get involved. Before Jimmy and his brother Buck head off, they go to clean Buck's room and find a big disgusting slime who they promptly defeat and then Jimmy begins to imagine himself as the slime. And with this empathy, Jimmy obtains the power to transform into the slime at any time using his imagination. This is where one of the game's big mechanics is introduced, transformations. We'll get back to those later. Anyway, Jimmy and Buck then set off to get that honey. So with that basic premise out of the way, let's get into one of the most important things in any RPG, the battle system. Now of course, since this is an RPG Maker game, I didn't expect too much from this, but I still wanted to get some fun out of it. Like, Lisa is an RPG Maker game, and it's pretty basic aside from a few things, but because there are so many party members and every fight feels so important, I couldn't help but love it. So with that said, what does Jimbo do? Well, it's pretty standard aside from the transformations adding some depth to it. I'm not gonna go too deep yet, but I'll just go ahead and say that a lot of the party members you get are pretty standard RPG archetypes, and because of that, I just found myself using the same strategy with each of them and only had to change things a few times to accommodate for certain enemies. Though, Jimmy has his transformations. You get a good handful throughout the game. These give Jimmy a bunch of different abilities and modify his stats a bit. For example, the first one, the slime, will make Jimmy more defensive, and it has an ability that will make all the enemies target him. I want you to punch me! Another example is the flower, which offers supportive abilities in exchange for a bit of attack. Also, outside of battle, I'd like to mention that if you're above a certain level, then the game will give you the option to skip encounters by pressing the X key. It's pretty nice to have when you just want to explore, though for some reason this option didn't pop up too much for me, even whenever I felt like I wasn't breaking a sweat taking them out. But speaking of exploration, let's talk about that. You travel to certain areas on the map and go through them kinda like a level or something. Wow, I'm so tiny. Uh, they're filled with some pretty good sprite work and they're all really unique. Also, there are plenty of side areas off the beaten path. Like in one place I found this tunnel and got lost and scared and it kind of reminded me of something that happened to me in real life except this time there was a lot more molesting. Anyway, point is that it was pretty cool. Okay, we don't have any time to waste doing this dumb stuff. In order to get the honey from the bees, they want us to stop the petty thieves from doing dumb stuff. So we go to Dumbo Hideout, enroll as a member, laugh at info guy, and then we have one of our first major fights. And these guys, well, I, I kinda struggled against them. To be fair, there are ways to make them easier if you look outside the box, which I think is cool and creative, but I wasn't aware of any of that. I guess I just didn't expect there to be options like stealing their weapons by using the goon transformation, but eh, that's my fault. Then their leader Punch Tanaka comes in and promptly beats my ass flat. Look. 
Knocker, don't get me wrong. Punch the Knocker is super epic. Absolute Chad. But dude, this fight is kinda dumb. I hate how he has a counterattack that practically screws you over if you don't see it coming, and there's no way to know that it's coming. And unlike Caillou with knives and the gang, there aren't many ways to make this fight easier aside from grinding. Regardless, I got through it eventually, and I proceeded forward because I really wanted that honey, and... Uh... What happened at the beehive? Did somebody open up Peter or something? Oh dear lord, I think we might be doomed. And at the end of the place, the, the queen, gosh, the queen, her sudden shift in behavior, this whole scene when you encounter her deep into the hive, it just gets under my skin. She finally pops out and... <laughs> Mom, there's something wrong with the bees! And then abduction. Yep, Jimmy's family just randomly gets abducted, and his grandmother is part of the computer system? What? Oh, okay, this is just one of the petty thieves of stupid shenanigans, and their leader is... A, a dog? Silent Hill 2 moment? Boys. Yeah, and then the thing crashes and you're in the next area all of a sudden. Literally nothing I said back there made any sense whatsoever. What's up with the bees? Why is this dog so evil? Why won't grandma just leave me alone? With all that said though, I wasn't really on board with all of this. Initial impressions were pretty positive, but everything that happened back there, well, I wanted there to be creepy moments and absurd scenarios, however, none of that had any rhyme or reason to it at all. But I guess it's not really a huge deal, it's just that I was a little bit flustered with some of the hard fights and throwing all this confusing stuff at me wasn't helping. But hey, the villain is a dog for a little bit, so that's pretty epic. Boys. Even though all that stuff that just happened is less coherent than an average Twitter user's thoughts, I'm gonna have to just deal with it. This is an Earthbound-esque game, and it's already beginning to get crazier than that. And now I will explain to you why I'm not so quick to give up on certain games. Jimmy will reunite with some of his family members as well as other characters at certain points and they'll join him for the adventure. At the end of each area you'll fight a boss and for some reason each is more disturbing than the last. Then you'll find yourself on a completely new map. Your party will usually get swapped out too. For example, in the second area you get Jimmy's mother Helga and the virgin Jonathan Bear to join you. However, in the next couple of areas you'll find the other family members, like Lars, who makes the slime transformation more relevant than my YouTube channel, and Andrew, who is your typical black mage character. Pairing these standard designs with Jimmy's transformations can actually lead to some creative strategies. I loved Andrew's ability that made it where an enemy would take double damage from the next attack that hit them. As the game progressed, I kept reforming the strategy I made to do the most amount of damage possible until I came up with one that did around 80% of an optional boss's health. It was insane. It's actually a pretty solid amount of depth here for an RPG Maker game, though I should clarify that I'm mainly talking about Jimbo whenever I say that. Like I've said, the other party members are really straightforward whenever it comes to their roles, and there isn't much flexibility with them, but Jimmy is a completely different story. Jimmy can switch to any of his forms in the middle of a battle, and later on, this opens the door to so many different possibilities. In the early game, Jimmy will mainly just switch to whichever role needs to be filled, like tank or healer. But whenever those roles get filled later on by other party members, then you can get pretty wild. Wow, it's almost like imagination is a really fitting term. Sure, ones like the flower become almost useless later on, but there's all sorts of fun to be had with ones like the vampire with all of its different abilities. Or my personal favorite, the bird, which goes fast and essentially acts like a nuisance to the opponents while still doing solid damage. All of this can make for some interesting fights, specifically the bosses. For example, there's this one boss that's a pair of two eyes, and I didn't understand how they worked at first. Basically, whenever you hit an eye, it either shuts or opens, and at the end of the turn, one of three things will happen. They'll hypnotize someone if one eye is closed, or outright kill one of them if they're both closed. However, if they're both open, then they won't do anything. So once I figured that out, I had to put a lot of planning into making sure that each turn ended with both eyes open. It was a pretty tense and fun fight. Oh, and the EXP you get is also applied towards Jimmy's transformations. When a transformation levels up, you'll get an extra point in the stat assigned to it, and if you get enough level ups, then you'll unlock passive abilities and attacks. The best way I can describe it is like in Bravely Default and Bravely Second, where you can have a secondary job and use passive abilities from other jobs. Now obviously, in terms of depth, that's like comparing a kiddie pool to the Pacific Ocean, but I still think it's definitely welcome. But Luggle. 
Why the actual frick would you want to play as Jimmy if his transformations have all these cool attacks? Well, I didn't know this until after I finished the game, but you see those slots there? I thought these were bugged or something. I would put an attack on them, but they wouldn't appear in my list in battle. As it turns out, these extra slots are only active when you're not using any transformations. I don't think they ever tell you about this in-game, so I only used Jimmy's normal form for probably a grand total of... two minutes. Whoops. Another great thing about this game has to be the areas. They're so colorful, vibrant, varied, and most importantly, fun to explore. It was always so exciting to find myself on a brand new map and see just what it had to offer. The areas are just so much fun to traverse thanks to some of the conveniences I mentioned earlier. There's plenty of optional stuff you can find, and the transformations open the floodgates for all sorts of puzzles. Admittedly though, I sometimes forgot what the transformations could do on the overworld. The vampire can do this thing where it goes- <laughs> But I mean, I don't think that's ever used for anything actually important. It is fun though. <laughs> also, this dumb ice puzzle can go shove a pineapple into its pee pee hole. Like, I spent 10 minutes trying to find a solution, only to realize I was doing it backwards and the actual solution is so simple that a newborn squirrel could figure it out. But yeah, the point is that this was just as fun as battling, and that's a huge plus considering that exploration in RPGs can be really hit or miss. Uh, there's a part late into the game where a bunch of side areas are unlocked and you can explore them and fight optional bosses for some great equipment so that you can take on some of the later foes. They're really fun, and I appreciate there being so much content for a game like this. Also, I'd like to point out that there's one part where the game parodies this one genre, and it's extremely funny. I mean, the joke is definitely dragged out for a bit longer than it should have been, but man, I, I just, I don't care. And no, before you ask, I'm not talking about Everchip. It's funnier than that. Yeah, the game can be really funny. That's one of the most defining attributes of games like this, and they all somehow manage to nail it. There's a lot of crude humor in there, but dude, I put the rude in crude, so I love this stuff. And man, poor info guy, he just wants to give me information about stuff I don't care about, and he keeps dying, dude! Holy crap! And I can't forget about Punch Tanaka. I talked about him on my last countdown, but I simply can't sing enough praise about this character. He's kind of full of himself, which is pretty funny and not annoying because he's pretty respectful of others. Every ounce of dialogue from him puts a smile on my face, and I adore characters that can do that. Not to mention, he gave me an illegal mp3 file! Let's go, bro! Man. As for some issues I have, well, I only really have one. The difficulty is pretty inconsistent, and before anyone says anything, I did periodically swap between easy and normal mode, but regardless, I made sure to play an area on normal mode first and switch to easy later or whenever I needed to grind a bit. Anyway, what I mean by inconsistent is that even when I could handle the enemies with no trouble whatsoever, I could still have my butt served on a platter by the boss of that area. Now, of course, the boss has to be a greater challenge, that's pretty obvious, but but I think that if I'm holding my own against the enemies with no trouble whatsoever, then that kind of implies that I'm probably ready to fight the boss of that same area. This was most apparent whenever I was just breezing through enemies in the final area, yet I wasn't able to make a dent into the penultimate boss without getting destroyed. And even when I switched to easy mode, I still fell apart halfway through the fight and I had to grind a couple levels and get some more equipment from side quests to win. To be fair though, the difficulty can still add a lot to the game and it really forces you to make cool strategies strategies to win. It's satisfying when you overcome a hard fight because of good planning, it's just that I wish the difficulty overall could have been a bit more balanced. Now with all of that said, you probably still have some more questions on your mind. What is this whole adventure all about? I, I guess it hasn't really been explained, and more importantly, what even is the pulsating mass? This game has a lot of really unnerving moments in it. That moment in the beehive, there is a lot more like it. Every single end area boss is disturbing in its own right, I'm not going to show them off yet for spoiler reasons, but their designs and the buildup surrounding each of them is so frightening. For one example, and keep in mind this is a minor spoiler, uh, for a little bit you have Jonathan Bear in your party, and at one point while they're alone, Jimmy pushes Jonathan into this huge furnace. He then proceeds to say a lot of threatening things about Jimmy, like how he can never run away from him. 
And then he proceeds to talk about how Jimmy even got Jonathan in the first place by shoplifting him. I know that shouldn't sound so scary, but the imagery here, along with the music and this bad side of Jimmy being revealed, just made me really uncomfortable. The climax to this whole segment is excellent too, I dare not spoil it. There are several other aspects about the game that can get disturbing too, even the dialogue when Jimmy is imagining himself as something else. And they can get pretty descriptive, a little too descriptive. The ghost one in particular, actually made me the slightest bit depressed. Okay, I guess I might be beating around the meat too much. Let's talk about the titular pulsating mass itself. So what is it? It's a lot of things, but I'm not going to give away the answer just yet. Throughout the game, the mass pursues Jimmy in several different forms for some reason. It's apparently something that's been around since the beginning of time itself. It's everlasting, and probably unstoppable too. Having an unstoppable thing named the pulsating mass sounds awesome, but trust me, it isn't. But yeah, from everything you hear about it and how it sounds, I was really intrigued to find out exactly what it was, a sentiment shared amongst a bunch of other people. To emphasize all of this, whenever anybody is talking about the pulsating mass, they always highlight the word it. Man, I never thought that highlighted text would be so scary. I originally wanted to stop the video here, but due to the lack of content content surrounding this game, I think I want to be one of the two people online to express my thoughts about everything spoiler related. If this looks up your alley, then I really do recommend it, despite some of the issues I had. So if you're interested, then I'd say you should go ahead and give it a shot. Anyway, let's get into some spoiler territory. So after the fight against the corrupted Jonathan Bear from Hell, Buck gets taken away and the pulsating mass supposedly has him. Past this point, Jimmy regroups of his family as they form a plan to stop the mass by getting a hold of the secret knowledge, which has the info to stop it. Later on though, they find that Buck has become corrupted too. With the help of some others including Punch Tanaka, the group makes their way to the central hub with the mass growing unstably strong. Just when everything is about over, Buck comes in and Punch sacrifices himself to let the family escape. Escape. They return to see that the mass has taken over the central hub and that Punch is presumably dead. They then have to go across the world to find several points to unlock the central hub again. All of these reveal some of Jimmy's memories for some reason. Then you make it inside the final area of the game, the pulsating mass itself. I really hope that doesn't awaken anything in me. This area is really great. It's creepy and has so many weird horrors crawling all over the place. Jimmy and his family defeat Buck and return him to his senses, but then the pulsating mass takes control of everyone else, and now they have to fight it in this Gygus-esque battle. Yeah, it's exactly what I expected it to be, and I like it for that reason. It's easy, but slow-paced and very tense, while also getting under your skin. After the fight, Jimmy is finally able to read the secret knowledge, and the mass is dead. Yep, but that's the ending. I honestly thought I got a bad ending at first. I couldn't believe that the game would just have this unsatisfying ending. Like seriously, it just dies and everyone goes home? That's such a lame ending for a game that had such unimaginable horrors. And the finale was so good up until this point. It just dropped off so hard though. However, maybe I was a bit too quick to judge. Something about the ending felt really off like there was more to be seen, and when you walk outside of the house despite Helga pleading with you not to do so, so if you don't understand what the pulsating mass is yet, then according to a lot of stuff I've read, it's supposed to be cancer. That's not at all what I was thinking when I heard the name Pulsating Mass, but to the game's credit, this twist puts a lot of things into perspective. This whole story is taking place inside of Jimmy's head, and a lot of it might be based off of stuff that has happened to him in his real life. Like at first, I thought that the dog was a form of the mass because haha ha, funny dog, but in one of the last areas in the game, you'll see some of Jimmy's memories, including one of a bald, younger looking Jimmy being attacked by a dog. Perhaps that was a traumatic experience of his. And other things such as his grandma being 
being a part of the machines on that ship, that doesn't make any sense at all. That is, until you see another memory of her on her deathbed hooked up to a bunch of machinery. Jimmy is supposed to be 8 years old, so there's no telling what he thinks of that. Even Buck turning into this monster at the end, I haven't really thought about what that could represent. Maybe Jimmy saw his brother as a bully for repeatedly calling him weak when in reality, Buck just wanted his struggling little brother to become stronger. The pulsating mass didn't end up being what I expected it to be, but after looking back on the entire adventure, it really does make a lot of these nonsensical things make sense. I still would have liked another phase of the final boss though. So that was Jimmy and the pulsating mass. I didn't absolutely adore it as much as other people did, and I didn't love it to the same extent as Earthbound or Lisa, but I still think this game is really great. It's yet another unique take on this crazy RPG concept, and it had one of the most interesting video game adventures I've been on in forever. Still, nobody is talking about it, and it hasn't really picked up the attention that other games like it have. So if this looks up your alley, then I definitely recommend it. It gave me a gaming experience that I will never forget.